Hi, I'm Jim Araj, and today we're going to visit Wayne Teasdale, who's a Catholic theologian and one of the most knowledgeable participants in the growing Christian-Hindu dialogue. He lives here at Hundred Acres Monastery, a Christian lay community of about 10 men and women near New Boston, New Hampshire. And he is a close friend and disciple of Bede Griffiths, a Benedictine monk who heads a Christian ashram or meditation center in India. Wayne has much more than a theoretical interest in Hinduism and describes himself as a Christian sannyasi, who is someone who tries to live out the contemplative traditions of both Christianity and Hinduism. How did the Christian-Hindu dialogue begin in India? Well, it, it began really um, probably even before the 16th century, before De Nobili, Roberto De Nobili, when probably, I can't document this, but I, here I have to speculate, but given the fact that Christianity has been in India for, well, certainly more than, more than five, six, seven hundred years, they claim, the Indian church claims, that St. Thomas the Apostle brought, brought the gospel to uh, India and was martyred in uh, Madras. Uh, and so they call themselves the St. Thomas Christians. And then the, um, the Catholic Church proper came, well, with the waves of uh, Jesuit uh, uh, missionaries, uh, Francis Xavier, and people like that, and Roberto de Nobili. Uh, but so Christianity has been in India for many centuries, and I'm just speculating, but I think that there probably must have been other people similar to a figure like Roberto de Nobili or or Besci, these uh, Italian Jesuits who came, and realized that there was some profound value to the Hindu uh, tradition, to their spirituality and their culture, particularly as they learned the language and began to speak to sadhus and sannyasis and uh, spiritual teachers, gurus. And they must have seen the authenticity of it. So I feel that um, there probably was that uh, period, and it's always going on. Abhishekdananda is a kind of a modern example of someone from the Christian tradition remaining a Christian, delving deep into, that, into the roots of that tradition on an experiential basis, and really living, that, living it and assimilating those experiences, those values, those insights, and relating them to his own faith. So I think that's been going on for a long, long time, but it really became um, an historical uh, fact with, with Roberto de Nobili, whose emphasis was missiological. He was a missionary, and he was looking for a strategy of evangelization. This was his idea. But in the process, he came, as he learned, uh, as he learned Tamil and Telugu, the uh, language of Andhra Pradesh, uh, another southern state, um, and uh, Sanskrit, and was the first to act that we know of in the na a non-Hindu to read the sacred texts of Hinduism, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the Ram Ramayana. He, uh, he began to see that there was a very deep spiritual experience behind these texts that was valid, and that, that the Christian tradition could not have sole monopoly over mystical experience or over spiritual insight. He began to recognize that this was a valid tradition. Though he remained a, a, a Christian, and though his commitment was to Christianity, and he wanted to bring Christ to the Hindu, and he did succeed in, uh, in converting a number of Brahmins. But what happened is 
he learned their culture, he learned their language, he learned their symbolism, their ritualism. Uh, he acquired a deep sense of their experience and had his own experience of it, had his own mystical experience. And he realized that, that the situation in India was, was not a question of imposing Christianity on a pagan culture, but somehow meeting them in their own tradition, you know, bringing them to Christ within their own tradition and bringing himself to their tradition, to an assimilation of their tradition as enriching himself, enriching his own spiritual life and enriching Christianity. So that process went on and he took sannyasa and he took it not as a, um, a ploy, you know, to, he took it because he realized that they had a, a um, very deep insight into spiritual transformation in that tradition. And he, th he felt that for him it was more, it was the next step in his own spiritual evolution. He couldn't remain simply a Jesuit living the way Jesuits live. They live a, a very um, kind of high life economically compared to a sannyasi who lives in utter simplicity. And he realized he couldn't live as a Jesuit in India. He couldn't live as a Westerner. He had to live as an Indian. So therefore, he took that radical ste step to respect, to, sh to show respect to their, tradi their culture. What did that entail? Well, that entailed that he, you know, that he that he um, stopped eating meat. You know, he became a vegetarian. Uh, he probably stopped eating um, uh, eggs and drinking milk and uh, started to go barefoot and he adopted the uh, kavi, the uh, sannyasic habit, the, the orange uh, saffron, the saffron habit of a sannyasi and felt that that was equivalent to his commitment as a Jesuit. So it was a deeper plunge into the life of, of India and into India's um, experience of asceticism and of the sacred. So it meant that he had to respect the, uh, the whole universe of India, and that's what he did. He completely... Um, abandon his Western packaging, if you will. He became an Indian. Even though he remained Christian, he became an Indian. And he wrote some very uh, original works in Tamil, which are considered classics. You know. Was there a follow-through on what he initiated? There was some, uh, and his, what he did was approved by, by Rome, by the, by the Pope. But he had a lot of opposition from the conservative Portuguese wing of the church in, uh, in India. You had the St. Thomas Catholics and you had the Portuguese. And he had a lot of problems with them. And they, they eventually were successful in subverting his experiment, which was really bearing fruit. They resented this. They, they felt that he was uh, capitulating to the, hint to the pagans. So there were others, this Beshi, but it wasn't as successful and as dramatic as uh, Dinobili. So then it kind of became dormant. I'm, I'm sure that there were many that did it privately, anonymously, and probably became very great saints in the process. How did the modern movement start? When the British came in, uh, one has to make a, make a uh, parenthetically, one has to make a, an observation about Britain coming into India. Uh, so many view that as negative, and it had many negative sides to it. But the British coming into India, in a sense, really did a lot to save Hindu culture, because the Hinduism was under attack by the Muslims, Mughals, and the British defeated them or they finished them off. And that really spared India's culture. It saved India's culture. But secondly, India, uh, England gave to India a sense of her identity as a nation because of the English language 
and the translation of the sacred works of India into English, and then the subsequent um, reading of those texts, studying those texts by Indian scholars, see, and other. It gave them a sense of identity as a nation and a culture. So those texts were made available and became, avail became accessible to Westerners. I mean, you can see the impact, for instance, of Hinduism in a not terribly sophisticated way on people like um, is Emerson and those people. That they, that, that they didn't learn Sanskrit, obviously. They, this was their contact through these texts. So that was going on, and um, then in the ne in the 17th century there was the Hindu Renaissance, where there was a, a, a reflowering or a refocusing of that tradition, and um, an assimilation of the social gospel dimension into Hinduism, and that, as that process was going on, there there probably was a lot of contact with Christian scholars. You know, the Jesuits uh, in India is a very uh, large group of scholars there, and they uh, many of them know Hinduism very, very well, and they have contacts with Hindus. Anyway, uh, but the, the next dramatic um, event life that came along that really gave a, a push to the, this modern uh, movement was uh, the um, the Indian who was a Brahman, uh, Brahma Bandab Upadhyaya, who was at the turn of the century, and uh, he was a friend of Tagore, but he also was a disciple of uh, Paramahansa and uh, Ramakrishna, and uh, Vivekananda's guru, and he also was a friend of Vivekananda's. And he didn't. He only lived to be 41, 42, something like that. But he played a very significant role in uh, this modern development. He he gave a lot of ideas to people like uh, Jules Moshanan and Abhishekdananda and Father Bede and uh, Sister Vandana and Sarah Grant. Men, there's so many in this movement that he inspired. Francis Acharya in Krishmala in in, uh, in Kerala, um, he that he was a very significant figure. He really was the first in India to openly declare the need for India to to uh, be independent of Britain as a matter of a goal, not just an idle concept. He had two publications. Sophia and I forget what, the century. He had, he he was editor of these two, not successively, not not to, um, simultaneously, but successively. And he would, you know, he would write these very strong articles uh, f about the need for independence from Britain, and he was the first to propose that. And um, so, in some sense, some people might claim him to be the father of Indian independence. Uh, maybe that's going too far. But he played a strong role, and he was a very clear voice. And the British destroyed all of his writings for that reason. You know, They imprisoned him, and they suppressed his writings. So to this day, very mm -hmm. few of his articles are available. Anyway, he was a Brahmin. And he first, he, he uh, became an Anglican, and then he became a Catholic, and then he decided to, to, to take sannyasa. And he took sannyasa, and, he's, and he made it very clear that Christianity could make no headway in India unless it became Indian and just shed its Western garments. It had to put on the, well, it had to put on the kavi, it had to put on the habit of India. It had to speak to India in a way that she understood and what she respected. So that he did that. He was the first, well, he was the first in the modern time to do that. And he also was the first to 
suggest the development of, a, of an Indian theology which drew its terms, its concepts, its ways of expressing the Christian mystery um, in the categories of India. So he was the first, for instance, to suggest uh, the term Satchidananda as uh, a way to um, formulate the notion of the Trinity in India. In fact, he wrote the most extraordinary hymn to the Trinity under the name Satchidananda, which to this day, every day, every evening, is sung at Shantivanam where Father Bede is. So that gives you some idea. His, um, he looked upon Vedanta as not rivaling the gospel. He gave it a, a kind of a status similar to um, kind of uh, Thomas's uh, metaphysics. He saw it as a metaphysics which would be available for Christianity to use to develop its own theology and its own articulation. What is the lineage of Father Bede? Shantivanam was established in 1950, and Jules Moshanan and Abhishekdananda, Henri Lasso, both Frenchmen, one a priest, the other a Benedictine monk and a priest, were the founders. But M Jules Moshanan came to India in the 30s, like, uh, oh, I'd say, I think it was 37, 38. It was 10 years before Abhishekdananda, or 12 years. And um, for the first, for those first ten years, he just was a parish priest in Trichy, Tiruchinapalli, which is uh, in Tamil Nadu, and uh, about 300 miles uh, kind of southwest of Madras. And he functioned as, as, a, as a priest there, speaking the language Tamil. But his dream was, you know, to establish an ashram, a monastic community. He is an incredibly holy man. Very, he is, I would say, he's a saint, uh, and very, very philosophical, very metaphysical. But he lived lived a very simple life and was very accessible to the people. Then, um, uh, Abhishek Dananda, Henri Lasso, Father Lasso, he came to India in the late forties, and he had made contact with. Uh, Moshanan a couple of years before and told him of his desire to come to India and establish a Benedictine community there. And the two of them would collaborate together. So he came and they did establish Shantivanam. But something very interesting intervened, and this was not the experience of Moshanan. Moshanan did not go as deep into India as did. Uh, as Hinduism, as did uh, Henri Lasso. Henri Lasso came and he completely plunged into India. He, uh, he went to Turvanamalai in uh, Tamil Nadu, the seat of one of India's greatest contemporary saints, modern saints of that time. And he had the darshan of uh, Ramana Maharshi the silent sage of uh, Arunachala, the holy mountain there in Tiruvannamalai. And he simply sat in his presence and was awakened. He was spirit, he was missed, he was awakened just by sitting in his presence. Because Ramana never uttered a word. He was what is called a muni, M-U-N-I, a silent seer. He never spoke. And he was that way since he was 17 years old, since his own awakening. He never had a guru, uh, Ramana. He was awakened, and that became the awakening, and the spirit became his guru. And so in the last year of his life, which was 1950, Abhishekdananda, Father Lasso, Anra Lasso, sat in his presence, and he was awakened. And he had a few contacts like that with Ramana, and then Ramana died. But Abhishekdananda would spend months in the caves of Arunachala at Turvanamalai. And there he was caught up in a vortex of depth, which he never got out of. 
it just got deeper and deeper and deeper. He was he was just totally pulled into the mystical life, and that became a tension with his task at Shantivanam. He always felt ambiguous about Shantivanam uh, and the whole Christian life there. I mean, he was a Christian, and he he said he would say his rosary every day to the end of his life, and yet he was a pure Advaitin, mm-hmm. meaning he had this experience of total unity with the Absolute, of non-duality. And you could not make a distinction between yourself and God because the unity was so deep. And so that was his consciousness, and yet he continued to say Mass and say the rosary and give retreats and things like that. But uh, Shantivanam was a very painful experience for him. He wanted to be out of there and up in the north in the Himalayas in a, in a hermitage, which he subsequently did in 68. So uh, these two, uh, Jules Moshanan and Abhishek Dananda, Father Bede knew both of them very well and uh, had, has tremendous respect for both of them, but felt that Moshanan truly is a saint, and but he didn't feel that Abhishek Dananda was, you know, he felt a mystic, yes, but not a saint. And um, Father Bede, you know, took his orientation to the movement and the language and the, the focus and the, the direction from these two, particularly from Abhishek Dananda. He's provided, you could say, the not simply the, the, the questions, but the whole language that's developing. It is a tradition. You don't just recreate it. You, you, you take your stand in it and you develop from there. So those have been his uh, predecessors. Now what about Father Bede himself? How did he end up in India? That's an interesting uh, development. He, uh, when he was a little boy in, um, in England, he lived n- not too far from a military base, and he would go there and uh, hang around with the soldiers. And there was a Sikh, there was a, a regiment of Sikhs there. And he got to be a good friend with, a, a, with a, a Sikh there. And that Sikh really gave him a sense of India, or a kind of a, a feeling for India, mm-hmm. or a longing for India. and. Uh, then uh, he went to school, and he was kind of vaguely agnostic, and he really had no religion. He was brought up an Anglican. But the last day of his uh, stay at school, before he went to Oxford, he, uh, he had a mystical experience of a nature variety. He had a, an experience of mi- a tr- profound presence and mystery in the presence of nature, and this awakened him he began to perceive on a, a deeper level. And so he bec- his religion became this religion of nature, natural mysticism, kind of like the Romantics and Emerson and Thoreau, the American transcendentalists. His religion became that, a, a natural type of mysticism. And he went, up to, he went up to Oxford, and of course this opened him. This experience so d- was so profound that it opened him to the search. It opened him to the spiritual journey, really. And he, his tutor was, uh, his main tutor was C.S. Lewis. And he and C.S. Lewis was similar to, to him. He, his orientation was this kind of vague agnosticism. But together uh, he shared his experience, and together they studied uh, the Bible as literature. And they both had an experience similar to that of Augustine where Augustine re- studied uh, the Old Testament and New Testament as literature for the rhetoric in it. And slowly the deep values and truths that were present there penetrated his heart and slowly led to his own conversion. So that happened to, to um, both Lewis and Father Bede, or Alan Griffiths as he was called. And um, they both came back to Christianity. And yet, Bede wasn't fully satisfied with Anglicanism. Lewis was. And what happened was Bede uh, read the Apologia Pro Vita Sua of um, 
of uh, Newman, his apology for his life, you know, and about his own conversion. And then he realized that there was something in the Catholic Church for him. And he became a Catholic in 31, and then a f month or two later entered uh, the uh, Prinish Abbey in Gloucestershire, which, was a f which w had been founded by Anglicans but came into the Catholic Church. So he went there, and uh, he, he said that he really felt that, that Prinish was the only place in England where he ever felt at home. So that was interesting. What happened was an, uh, a, uh, an Indian Benedictine monk by the name of Father Benedict Alipat came to England and met Bede and shared, you know, uh, in Bede's uh, longing to have a community in India, a Benedictine community, but totally open to India. And he invited him to do that, to come to India. And Bede did. He couldn't do it right away, but finally in 55, his abbot gave him permission. He went to India, and he's been there ever since. And they tried to found something in Bangalore, but that failed. And in that first year that Bede was there, he lived in the clergy house, and Ramanda Panikkar lived there. And the two of them together learned Sanskrit. They studied Sanskrit with a Sanskrit master. And then uh, when that experiment failed the, to found a community, he, he had been encouraged by Francis Mayer, Father Francis Mayer, a Belgian Cistercian, to found a community with him. And he resisted this for a long time. And, uh, but Father Francis, he's also called Francis Acharya, Acharya means teacher, kept at him for over a year with you know letters and encouragements and finally he gave in and they founded Kurishmala in 58 and uh, that he stayed there 10 years and then Abhishekdananda decided to leave Shantivanam and go mm -hmm. to Utakashi in the north in the Himalayas to his hermitage permanently because he had been dividing his time and he wanted to give up Shantivanam so he gave Shantivanam to Kurishmala, and Father Bede was sent I ostensibly, uh, temporarily, to Shantivanam to, to run the community for a few months. This was Father Francis's idea, but I think the Holy Spirit had other ideas, and Father Bede came there, and he stayed. And within a year or two, Father Bede's two chief disciples came from Kurishmala to join him, um, Christodas and uh, Amaldas. So he's been there ever since, and the community of Shantivanam was not viable under Abhishekdananda. Nobody would stay. People would come and go. Nobody stayed because he wasn't focused on it, and people saw, and so they didn't want to commit themselves to it. But under Bede, it has flourished. And they have, you know, many Indian vocations, and they're all Indians other than himself. So that's basically the situation. What kind of uh, life do they lead there? You're talking about a Christian san sannyasi. What does that mean? Well, Christian sannyasa means that um, the, how would you put it, the translation of the Christian spiritual quest and monastic, but it can include the monastic, but the, the, the mystical quest, the seriousness of the commitment to lead a spiritual life and the deepest sense of that. Translation of that life into an Indian context, which takes upon itself the insights of the Indian tradition to live that spiritual life. Sannyasa in the Indian tradition is 4,500 years old, at least recorded. It's probably even more ancient than that. So it's Christians respecting that tradition and learning from that tradition and adopting the um, ascetical 
practices of that tradition for their own life. That's basically what it is. What kind of daily schedule do the people at Shantivanam follow? They get it, we get up at five in the morning, you know, and uh, there's a few minutes of what's called Nama Japa at 5.10 for like five minutes. Nama Japa is a, just a very simple chanting of the name of God, you know, but what they d uh, do is they have a couple Christian ones. And then... What uh, does it sound like? Um, well, it's just, a, it's like a, well, like for instance, I the Hindus have one called Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. Well, you can say Om Nima Krishtaya. Om Nima Krishtaya, Om Nima Krishtaya. That's a simple one. Um, another one is Yezu, Yezu, Jai Jai Namo. That one we do at night. Before. So you have Nama Japa in the early morning for five minutes and before retiring at night for five minutes. And then the kind of the two, um, or Father B calls them the two pillars of the day, and this really represents well the Indian tradition, are meditation, an hour of meditation in the morning and an hour in the evening at dawn and sunset. So that's 5.30 to 6.30 in the morning and then 6 to 7 in the evening. So India is very much focused on meditation, not on liturgy, although they have the temple puja, the temple sacrifice, constantly. Uh, the real heart of India is contemplative, is interior, and, and is, is personal, is the individual uh, commitment to transformation through the meditative process and leading a, a disciplined life of self-denial and service. So there is the, the two periods of meditation. And in the morning after meditation at 6.30, there's morning prayer and mass every morning in the Indian style. There's an Indian form of the mass sitting on the, f on the ground, squatting, and using uh, the elements of the temple puja, the temple sacrifice, which would be the, uh, uh, the incense and the, uh, the uh, arate, the light thing, and the bells and uh, the music and even some of the, the prayers. They don't use the prayers, uh, the, of the Sanskrit prayers, from the Vedas in the Mass, but they will use them in the, in the morning prayer and the other forms of prayer. And then they sing, they sing bhajans, and the bhajan is a devotional song. So they've taken the Hindu bhajan and have created Christian bhajans. So they've taken the form of it, and, but the content is Christian. And, but they will use words from that, that are uh, equivalent, you know, like for Lord and for God and so forth and so on. So uh, you have that. And then uh, like at uh, 10 o'clock, there will be coffee for a half hour. And Shandivanam is, a, is international. People come from all over the world, you know, by the thousands every year. So they come and it's a chance for them to talk. And then um, at 12.10 is uh, midday prayer for 10 minutes, and followed by lunch. And uh, the, the food is extremely simple. Some would find it very austere. The lunch is the best meal because it will have rice and uh, a samba, which is almost like a soupy type of thing, and there'll be some some vegetables and uh, like a curd milk. It's it's like a very very liquid curd. It's very good. And uh, but breakfast, uh, ha they're usually what are called itlis, compressed rice. Uh, uh, you can't call them cakes because they're not sweet. But if you don't have a taste for them, they're not very very good. And uh, similarly, supper is very bland. And he wants, Father Bede's idea is that the, the ashram in its diet and life 
should reflect the village, which is very poor. So then, uh, then at three they have tea for a half hour, three, three or three thirty, and then uh, evening meditation is six to seven. And it's always done in private. You can meditate with others, but there's no organized meditation. And then evening prayer is seven to seven thirty. You know, and that's very lively. They do a lot of music in that. And Father Bede normally gives a homily a, a, every day at Mass and a, a discourse of about 10 minutes on the scripture that's being read that day. And it's always spontaneous. He never prepares it, you know. They're beautiful things. So then, uh, and then the evening, the Nama Japa is at 9 for 5 minutes, and then the day closes. So that's pretty much it. And they live in simple huts, one-room huts, smaller than this, you know, a common toilet. A uh, couple huts have toilets, but those are the the better ones, you know. And um, they don't use utensils, you know. Uh, they'll give them to guests if they need them. You know, they use their hands to eat. So that's basically it. There's no telephone there. There's no television. There's no radio. Father Bede won't have a telephone. So that's. Uh, but he takes Time magazine and the newspaper because he feels we should keep up with the news, you know. So that gives you some idea. What about work? Do they grow food or make handcrafts? They do have food. Uh, for instance, like they, Shandivanam is only about 12, 15 acres. And there is uh, another ashram, which is across the road, run by Sister Mary Louise and she takes care of a lot of the guests from Shantivanam. She has better accommodations and better food. And there are rice paddies. The ashram has rice paddies. So they have the rice paddies. They get the rice there. Uh, there are two or three crops a year. And then they have mangoes, you know, and uh, all sorts of vegetables and things like that. And they do have a herd of cows. And that's from them, from the cows, they can get the... Um, the curd milk, which they 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 make. Um, the monks do some work, but not that much, because they're in the advantageous position of having many workers from the village, 20, 25 workers, that they provide jobs for them. It's more of a service to them, you can see, because they need these jobs to survive. So. Because they have so many workers, it frees the monks so they can they can they do some manual labor, a couple hours a day, but they have a lot of time for study. And Father Bede has really encouraged development of their talents. Like um, one was a, a genius uh, a musician, composer, vocalist, and another was uh, as a great artist. And then you have some that are into social service in the village. You know, so that's kind of the situation there. Tell us how you got interested in, in all this. In all this? Yeah. Well, uh, it really began unconsciously for me. With when I was eighteen, I read Father Beat's autobiography, *The Golden String*, which I highly recommend. I, I think it's a it's a more of a mature work than something like The Seven-Story Mountain of Merton. The Golden String is such a brilliant um, example of the development of a mind, a person, from agnosticism to faith, and almost the phenomenology of that process, you know. It's a, bri it's a brilliant book for that reason. It's a good example of what happens, what the process is like. I read that when I was 18, and I was deeply inspired by his life. But I never followed up with it, you know. I, th I just read it and left it at that. And, um, but after finishing St. Anselm College, a friend of mine who was a monk had been to India twice and spent very long periods with Bede and he told me all about this. We taught for a year in Hartford together and uh, he told me all about that and I was very interested in uh, what Father Bede was doing at Chantivanam and I had some very deep questions about Hinduism 
and I really wanted to know the answer to these questions. And my friend uh, suggested I write to Beat, so I did. And that was back in 1973. And that began uh, our relationship through correspondence. And he invited me to come to India a number of times, but it wasn't possible in those years. And plus, I was into graduate school, and then I, stu you know, I was doing the doctorate at Fordham. But in 1979, when I was still at Fordham, he came over. This was his second visit. He had come in 63. He came over in 79, he told me, and I went and met him and uh, traveled with him uh, and took him to different places. And then uh, I went to Europe. He was still here. I had to go to Europe for some weeks. And I arranged to meet him in England on his way back to India. So I spent a couple of weeks with him in England. And then he came back again in, in 83. And I spent a good deal of time with him that summer. And he gave a tremendous 10-day uh, seminar in Kansas City, Kansas. And I went to that. And it was in the midst of that, taking in his uh, various lectures, his talks, that I realized that his thought was extremely important and it was something that had to be disseminated, had to be passed on. And at that time there were no studies done on him, just a few little popular articles. And I was going to do my dissertation on Kuzanis, Nicholas of Cusa, his uh, treatise on uh, reconciliation, you know, De recon rec Reconciliazione. And uh, because that was a work uh, of an interreligious nature, you know, cri Christians and Muslims. But I decided that this, to work on Father Beats, thought would be more significant. You know, it'd be a better contribution, a more needed one today. So uh, I suggested that to him. And at first he was against it. He didn't want, want me to do it. But then... Uh, he was at Kamaldoli, New Kamaldoli, the Kamaldoli's Hermitage in Big Sur. He's a Kamaldoli's monk now. He joined them in 1980. And the Kamaldoli's order itself joined the Benedictine order in 1962, which is kind of interesting, a whole order joining another order. And uh, so he was out there, and he wrote to me, and he said, you know, maybe that is a good idea that you do that, you know. So they encouraged me, and I got to work on it and did that toward a Christian Vedanta. What was it like to go to India for the first time? Well, that's very interesting because uh, I, uh, I really, like uh, several times, I was on the verge of going to India before I went in 86, November 86, for the first time. And I would always chicken out at the last minute because I was, I was afraid. I mean, it was a very big step to go to India, because India is like another planet, not like going to Canada or Europe. It's really like, it's another universe, India. Completely different sense of time and of life, you know. We in the West are, we have a tendency to be in control of our life and of our, our situations of the day. But in India, they're more on the level of the unconscious. And it, there's more spontaneity. It's a different sense of time, you know. And uh, I, I went to India with a certain sense of trepidation that I would freak out and want to come back in two or three days, you know. And I was praying for weeks ahead of time that I wouldn't freak out, you know, that I would stay, that I'd stick it out, that I'd stay there, you know. So I got there, and uh, I came through Madras. We landed in Bombay, but then I went right to Madras. And I stayed at a place called Aikyalium, which means Temple of Unity, run by an extraordinary Indian Jesuit, um, Father Ignatius Hiradeum, who is a great uh, spiritual figure. You know, He's truly deep into the dialogue, and he's a very holy man. He's in his 70s now. And he established Aikyalium. So this was a great way to come into the Indian culture and the si situation because um, I wasn't just thrown onto my own resources, you know, and had to stay in a hotel or a 
something, I was able to come right into the heart of where the dialogue was between Christians and Hindus in an ashram situation. So that was very helpful, and I loved that experience there. So then I went to Shantivanam, and the life was a lot simpler than Aikyalium. Aikyalium wasn't rich, but it was, uh, you know, I had my own room, and there was a, a toilet there and a shower, and uh, I had a lot of freedom there, and the food was good, you know, and uh, it was interesting. Then uh, I went to Shantivanam. Um, I had a little hut. In fact, the this, the very place where Abhishekdananda had his hut, they built another hut, they, and I was in that hut for a number of months. And um, the food was a problem, particularly the morning and evening, and I got sick, you know. And uh, when I got there, I mean, I just loved being with Father B, and I made so many new friends. But I went through this thing that I think many Westerners do, that you miss the comforts of home. You miss the things that we take for granted, you know, like, like um, toilet paper and a, a, a clean toilet and a, a warm shower and privacy, because India has very little privacy. They have no sense of privacy, the Indian. It's a very, very noisy country. I was so shocked that, you know, more than the poverty or anything else and the dirt and the filth um, and all those people, wherever you go, you know, crowds and crowds of people, the, the noise, what, no one prepared me for the level of noise of an Indian village. The blasting of loudspeakers at two and three in the morning, you know, or the noises from the temple, you know, at five and six. I wasn't ready for that. And that, those things and the discomforts were getting to work on me in my soft American way. And I, I just was dreaming about going back to America. I couldn't wait to go back, you know. But then I got sick. And I had some very good friends there who, a couple of them nurses, and they really helped me. What happened is when I got sick, something different occurred. I. I came to the realization it's possible I could die, you know, I could die in India, that I might not get recover. And uh, I just surrendered to that and I accepted that. And once I had surrendered to that and accepted being in India, it just, the whole experience changed. Then it began, began to, I began to reach deeper levels of consciousness in there and had some very profound uh, awakenings, you could say. So I broke through the cultural thing, and then it was it was incredibly, incredibly positive. And this, each time, has been even more so. So that's been my experience. What is the goal of embracing these two traditions? Well, I'll tell you what the what it's not. It's not trying to build a super religion. You know, it's not building a new religion. Um, Father Bede often uses the metaphor of the hand, which I think is very instructive. You know, the, you could say the fingers represent the five religions, you know, and they, um, they're separate in their doctrines and dogmas, like the fingers are. But the fingers lead to the center of the palm, and the various religions on their deepest level lead to the center of reality, where they are one, but they're different expressions of that, that reality, different angles of perspective on it. So existential convergence, or you could say existential dialogue, whatever, is, its goal is to come to that depth of reality where they are one, and to relate our own experience to the depth in another tradition. That's the goal. And to make our own the insights of the various traditions, to build on to our own experience, our own tradition. Because it's all, it, all of it belongs to each one of us, you know. It, we're not separate from Buddhists and Buddhism and Hinduism and Jainism and Taoism and the native traditions and the Jewish tradition, Kabbalah. It's all part of our heritage. 
So it's a process of claiming that, you know, existential dialogue is a, is a process of assimilating that tradition, of breaking down the, the former barriers and living in that, in that tradition. What is the heart of the Hindu mystical experience? Well, um, you have to bear in mind that Hinduism has many s sects in it. You know, it isn't homogenous. Well, Christianity isn't either. So there'll be different emphases, you know. There'll be different emphases. There are different schools in Vedanta. By Vedanta, I mean the, the, the um, mystical and philosophical, metaphysical tradition of Hinduism, the self-consciousness of that tradition and its deepest level, the working out of the mystical insights of that tradition. There's a hodgepodge there. There are many, many insights there, you know. So I can try to, to give you that. But the heart of it has often, most Indians are, are Advaitins, pure Advaitins. So they'd follow the, uh, the ad Advaita meaning this experience of pure unity, non-duality, not two. In other words, the relationship with the ultimate or God, the divine mystery, is not one of distinction or dualism. It's not dualistic. It's one of pure unity or integration. Okay? Now, of course, how do you nuance that? What do you understand by that? How, uh, what does that mean? Now, that question of what does that mean, that's where the differences of interpretation come in, or the various schools. You, know, like you could say uh, Advaita, or dvaita, duality. Some would say, yes, there is duality, there is dis distinction. So there's a, d a dvaitic school and an advaitic school. So a, d a, a dualistic school and an, a non-dualistic school. Then there is, there, there's qualified advaita, so that uh, qualified non-duality. See, so you can go on and on uh, in making these distinctions. But I think that the experience the depth of that tradition can be articulated something like this, that, um, that the ultimate reality and the human reality and the creation are one. They are one. On their deepest level, they are one. Or if you use the um, structure that uh, is, is common in the East and was also in our tradition, that there are three levels to reality the appearing universe. I hate to even use the word physical because, you know, that's, that's a very relative term. But so the appearing universe wi with all its apparent multiplicity, it, the dis infinite number of details to it and distinctions. Uh, and then the psychological level or the soul level where there is a unity of experience already in, say, the unconscious. We see that in the unconscious and the archetypes of the unconscious that we all have in common. There's a unity already. Then the spiritual level where it's all one, it's integrated, and we're trying to get to that level of depth which we all have in common. And so Hinduism, the Hindu mystic, and all mystics are talking about that, that level, that level of unity where it all comes together. And meditation is a process that, that brings us more and more to a realization of that integration. So anyway, if you keep that in mind, that the, uh, the, the mystic in Hinduism is tuned into that experience of unity. And some will go so deep into the unity that they will obliterate any sense of their own identity as distinct from, you know, or separate from the one, or the ultimate, or the source, or Brahman, or whatever you want to call it. And um, where they can almost say that they, they have no reality. And they will, can say, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, I am God. They can make that statement. Eckhart made that statement, too. Um, but I think that um, a more nuanced approach a more living with it, we see that we're talking about an experience that we don't have a language for, and an experience in which the identity is so profound 
that our own human identity seems like seems unreal or a shadow it's a shadow but is that identity unreal or is it that it has found its larger integration it's found an integration a larger identity it's not that its identity is so is unreal it's that it's found the roots of its identity see it's found something uh, larger like the plants are, are rooted in the earth its larger identity is the earth so that we are finding our larger identity but th I don't think it means that our identity is unreal it's just that it is relative it's related to this uh, larger identity so that would be my understanding of it you know that um, or put it in Christian terms we are related to God, the Divine One, the Trinity, in, in much the same way that the persons of the Trinity are related to each other. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's my I intuition of it. So Hinduism, you, you can have these pure Advaitins who will say that there is only Brahman. That's all. There's only Brahman. And... Uh, our task is to get back to that consciousness where we can say, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. See, I am Brahman. The deepest self in the human, in all things, is Brahman, or Atman, the presence of the self, the presence of God in the uh, deepest level of human subjectivity is God, or is Brahman, Atman. So there is that. But then the tradition you know, has developed because religions are like human beings. They grow. They develop new insights, new experiences. And there is the personal dimension, the personal experience of God, which is very big in the Bhagavad Gita, which is the compendium of the whole tradition. Everything is summed up in the Bhagavad Gita. And the whole uh, insight, the, the Purusha, the cosmic Lord, who is similar to the Logos in Christianity, because in uh, the notion of the Purusha, the Hindu tradition, Hindu mystics, have come to the realization that, that deep within the unity and the goal of the unity is to reach the personal dimension of the Godhead, the Purusha. And um, there is the uh, scattered in the Upanishads and in the Vedas, but articulated very clearly in the Svetasvatara Upanishad is the statement, and this is found many times in the Upanishads, um, I know him, that great person, Purusha, of the color of the sun beyond the darkness. It is only no in knowing him, the Purusha, the cosmic lord, that one passes beyond death, and there's no other way to salvation. So they come to that insight that you have to you have to go through the Purusha, the Logos, to get to the Godhead. The final integration is beyond even unity. It's not just an, a question of experiencing the unity, the non-duality. And my, some mystics make the mistake that when they reach unity, they think that's it. But well, the unity has a nature a dynamic character to it. And that is what the Purusha is leading us to. And that makes sense of our human experience because all our experience is personal. The personal as a category of our, our understanding, our consciousness, our life, is, is um, essential. We can't get away from it. That is what we are. That is, we are relational beings. And uh, communion is the goal of our, all our relationships, at least ideally. And so that, I think, is an insight that um, was coming, developing, evolving within Hinduism. Was they were coming to that. And then the, um, the way to crown off all of that um, is that the, the unity that has a personal dynamism in it which the cosmic lord of Purusha leads us to understand um, has, you could say, to use a Christian term, community as a goal, 
community within the Godhead, or what is expressed in the notion of Satchitananda. Sat Chit Ananda, that the Absolute is a trinity of three essential, uh, relatable, interrelatable um, experiences. Isn't doesn't quite get its consciousness that ultimately there is the experience that you are or it is pure existence. Pure existence, like St. Thomas Aquinas speaks of um, esse, God as ipsum esse, ip, pure being, the pure act of existence, which he kind of um, pulls out of uh, Exodus 3.14 when Yah Yahweh says, I am who I am, or I am pure existence, I am pure presence, the pure presence of to be. So that sat in that experience of the Godhead, it is the pure focus or fountain of being, of existence. Like we have existence, we share the existence of God, the divine. And so we're always changing and trying to become more and more real in relation to what God is. That's the whole essence of change, is to become what we are not yet. So in this intuition, this experience, that God is this pure sat, this pure being. But more than that, he is the full self-comprehension of that, that being. So he's, he's chit, he's pure consciousness. So he, in his pure consciousness, is aware that he or it is pure existence, pure being. And that pure awareness of being the totality of being or the fullness of existence leads to this realization of total bliss. There's no fear. There's no anxiety. There's nothing to worry about. Everything is okay. So Sat Ananda is a symbol or a metaphor for the Godhead's nature as the act of the awareness of the fullness of existence in, in, in bliss. The bliss of being totally conscious of being the fullness of existence, if that makes any sense. So that's it. How would you relate Christian contemplation in which someone has a personal experience with God to Hindu mystical experience? I think, I think they are relatable. I just think they're, they're at, at different levels of the issue. Right. Uh, that's what I want you to do, try to articulate the different levels. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll try. I'll try to do that. See, I think that, as a, again, that when you experience pure unity with God, um, there is the temptation to feel that the identity of the person is obliterated. That it, or, or that the experience of being overshadowed by God, being overwhelmed by the divine, it so invades the identity of the person that the person's identity is submerged, becomes so totally passive, and experientially becomes, feels like a shadow identity. It's like a phantom identity. And that one can uh, jump to the conclusion that uh, one's identity is not real because it's overshadowed, it's overwhelmed, it's invaded, you see. So I think that much of the language of, of uh, pure unity, the pure unity, which almost entails a monism or, or a kind of um, uh, pantheism, that I think those pantheistic statements derive from a misunderstanding of the experience of unity. And maybe even not going beyond the pure unity to discover the identity, the divine identity, and one's relationship with that identity. That's what I feel. That's what I... Now, why would they misunderstand? Um, I think p partially because the experience is so overwhelming and they don't have the language 
of unity to they don't have we all our language is dualistic our empirical lang our language is empirically derived from the experience of a dualistic type of consciousness the subject object uh, dichotomy and all of our normal everyday experience comes through those modes you know and it's difficult to transcend that so that when you uh, when you do experience something of the divine and that you have an experience a unitive experience well there's no there's nothing to compare it with except this and this is so dualistic and this breaks down that dualism and so one can jump and say oh well the dualism is false i mean the distinctions are false there's only pure unity you see so i think that there's that misunderstanding and secondly i think that when people experience pure unity there is the temptation to stop the journey there and say i I know that uh, uh, Aurobindo, Sri Aurobindo, he had the experience of, of Advaita, but he, he, he kept going. And he said that, you know, that, uh, that it's deeper than Advaita. There's more to, to the divine than just Advaita. There's more to see. There's always more to see and experience. You can't just stop at one. The, the divine is, is infinitely inexhaustible. And so there, I think there's a, a stunting of the growth, and they just stay on the level of just th focusing on the unity. And I think the unity is just the non-duality, the Advaita, just states the reality of, the ontological reality of entering into the presence of God. But it just kinds of take, it takes you into the, into the, into the alcove of that experience. But it doesn't begin to articulate or formulate or give you any sense of, of the nature, you know, of the, the dynamic nature of the Godhead. Would it be fair to say that it takes someone into the inwardness of the Godhead? Yeah, it takes you into the inwardness of the Godhead. When you say alco, how would you continue the analogy? Yeah, okay, I'll try to. It's difficult, you know, because... Um, when you get to this depth, it's, you know, the apophatic way, the way of darkness, the via negativa is appropriate. Or like the, in the Hindu tradition, they have the neti, neti, you know, it's not this, it's not that. And I don't think we can actually say what it is in the vivity and intensity of the realization, the experience, but we can point to that. And uh, say again, I, it's, it, it, there is the personal. God is both personal and impersonal. See? So the whole Buddhist nirvanic consciousness, that is a dimension of God's, of the Godhead. And the pure Advaita thing is a dimension of it. But the personal is also a dimension of it. And then that makes sense of the human experience. So the personal, it is uh, dynamically interrelatable. There's a, dy a dynamic communion going on within God, within the divine. And in Christian terms, we say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we have to be very careful about those words because the experience of God as the Trinity, as dynamically communitarian or relate, relating itself to itself, within itself, um, you can use thousands of different words to express that. And Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are they're okay but they don't they don't give us a real sense of it at all all they do is they point to the personal reality the personalness of it the personalism of it but it doesn't you know god isn't literally a father a son and a holy spirit you know he's a spirit but i don't think those terms really get at it and I, and and you can see that Disparage, disparagement when you look at uh, Sat, Chit, Ananda or Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. Y you know, you can, you, you can discern that the dynamic or trinitarian or triadic experience is at the heart of reality because it's found in all traditions. But you find that the emphasis of those terms are different because they're trying to name the unnameable, really, you know. So, 
I would say that that God is the divine, the Godhead is a community of being. And that's what we're trying to point at when we when we develop this concept of Trinity. You know, it's it's it is uh, acknowledging the dynamic quality of the Godhead and is naming um, or indicating uh, something of the identity of the Godhead. How God is God is through this dynamic process of self-relationship. So that's, that's how I would, uh, would uh, understand it. What are the kind of problems you see in the Christian-Hindu dialogue? Well, I think one problem would be uh, syncretism, you know, to force a synthesis where, there, where it hasn't yet evolved into clarity, if you just kind of push it, throw it together. Um, that, that would be one. Another danger would be superficiality, you know. If you, if you make the, um, did you, you say dialogue? If you make the dialogue too um, unreflective, if the dialogue is, is just based on um, good feeling and wanting to get along and wanting to please one another, you may make compromises. So I would say that uh, one problem is this pro is superficiality and or to force a synthesis where it, there isn't one yet clearly seen. Um, and also that, you know, we could, e either side could lose their identity in the other. That's another problem. You mentioned how deeply Henri Lasso entered into the Hindu experience. But what's your opinion of how well he integrated this experience with his Christian tradition? Yeah, that's a very good question. He ag it was an agony for him, you know, it really was. And if you read his, um, this biography by James Stewart, uh, through his letters, it's almost like an autobiography because it's his letters, y you see that this man just was torn apart I inwardly because well, he knew from his own experience that Advaita was Advaita or and such at Ananda, that that was accurate, that was true. He also knew from his own experience that the Trinity, Christ and the Trinity are true. And he knew also that they were relatable, that they were related in some way, some mysterious unknown way. But he didn't know how. And it wasn't so much that his writing was an attempt to uncover how. It wasn't, that wasn't the case, because he knew he couldn't do it. And he could, he could strain as hard as he could, but he couldn't. He always would lapse into Eckhartian language when he talked about these things. When he talked about the depth of his experience, he always fell back on Eckhart. He wouldn't acknowledge that, but he would use Eckhart's terms. Um, he was really trying to relate it in his own life, in his own heart, and his writing came out of that. But I think his real intention was to integrate it in his own experience. And he agonized with it to the end of his life. And at the end, he did integrate it, but he didn't fully articulate it. Would it be possible that Catholics or Christians who are not well grounded in their own traditions would start practicing Hinduism and end up at Advaita and not see that there are two experiences that ought to be brought together. Yeah, I think that's happened many times, many, many times. And I think, for instance, just on a, just a kind of a perusal of contemporary American re religious consciousness, I mean, all these uh, different groups, you know, the Hare Krishna people, or, um, Baba Haridas in California, who's an authentic Hindu guru, and uh, Ma, or this Jewish housewife who had these visions and s became a Hindu Christian guru in, uh, in Florida, you know, and there are many phenomena like that indicate p 
people who did not have a very strong foundation in their own tradition and then were plunged into the depth of Hinduism mm -hmm. and uh, became formed in that. You know. So yeah, that's true. That's very true. But the other thing is this, that when you have someone, this is our experience in the monastic tradition, and I'm sure it's the experience of Christians who aren't monks, that, um, that uh, when you are deeply grounded in your tradition, and you have some experience of the mystical life in your tradition, then you have a good foundation to go into another tradition. And when you go into the other tradition, what inevitably happens is it takes you deeper into your own. See, you discover Christ and the Trinity on a deeper level there. Again and again, that's, that, that has been, and that's been Father Bede's experience. Would it be fair to say that while these two mystical experiences are deeply interrelated, they are not identical. Yes, I think that's fair to say. I mean, well, let me put it this way. Um, as far as my knowledge and insight and experience extends, that would be the direction I would go in. I could be wrong. Maybe they are identical. And, and maybe it's a perspectival issue, that they're just different perspectives on the one reality that we were talking about before. Or, if they're not, I'm more inclined to this view, be, that uh, in, mi in, th in, the, in, the, in mysticism, we are all only novices. We're all only disciples. Even the greatest masters are only disciples. But um, I'm inclined to think that these are all parts of the puzzle. You know, they're different aspects, and they're all true, and therefore they're all relatable. But I don't think they're all equal. I really don't. What about the Hindu side of the Christian-Hindu dialogue? How interested are Hindus in this dialogue? You're, you're absolutely right about that. We, we've had so much frustration with Hindus. They, they, uh, they don't seem to have the seriousness of commitment to dialogue as, as, as we do. That's number one. Number two, uh, they will enter into dialogue, and there are some Hindu spiritual teachers and scholars, pundits, who are fascinated with it and are interested in it and are even committed to it. But, um, of course, they always take, they always see it within their own context, that Hinduism embraces everything, you know. And I remember a, uh, something that an Indian priest showed me, or a gesture that he made, which indicated to me uh, how many Christians in India feel about Hinduism, but could equally be said uh, the danger that they felt about Hinduism, but also that they have learned from hard experience with uh, Hindus, the tendency. And I said, well, you know, how do you feel about, about Hinduism uh, and Christianity, the dialogue? And he says, well, we must be careful because this can happen you know, that Hindu can, can hijack Christianity Christ and put it in its pocket and neutralize it and make it a sect of Hinduism. So that is a real danger that, um, that Christians can lose their identity in a kind of um, superficial dialogue where all the differences are obliterated and, you know, that's the danger. And Hindus have a tendency to do that. They only see unity, which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a deceit on their part. It's, it's their culture, where we in the West see distinction, they see unity, see? And on a deep level, you know, they're, they're, they've got a point. So that is, uh, that, that's the problem. And so that probably indicates why they're not as seriously uh, focusing on dialogue as, as some Christians are. 
Do you think that a genuinely Indian Catholic Church is going to develop? Yeah, I do. Th I think so, and I think it is happening. I mean, one has to uh, make the observation, though, that the the Catholic Church in India is so different from the Catholic Church in America, which is a very liberal, progressive, dynamic church. But the Catholic Church in India is a church with almost a siege mentality in relationship to Hinduism. So that on the one hand, there are many progressive uh, people in the church in India, but then there's a real, uh, a real kind of conservatism too, which resists the relationship with Hinduism. You know, because they've been brought up uh, to believe that uh, Hinduism is paganism, it's diabolical, you know, and things like that. So there is that resistance. It's a fear of assimilation or whatever. But the point, one point that is a constant theme in Father Bede's thought, and he emphasizes it again and again ad nauseum, is that Christianity, Catholicism, whatever, in its traditional form is European, is Eurocentric, it's Western. It's the product of Greek and Rome, Greco-Roman civilization, Greek philosophy, Roman law, and culture. It is not universal in its expression. And that explains why after all these centuries of Christian missionaries in Asia, only 2% of Asia is Christian. See? That the form in which the, the gospel has been brought to Asia is totally unintelligible to, or the institutional form, is totally unintelligible to the Indian mind and to the Chinese mind, the Japanese mind, and the other cultures there. It's unintelligible. So therefore, and this is where Indian theology would come in, there has to be this enculturation process the translation of Christianity into the terms, categories, rites, symbols, metaphors, rituals, uh, the whole universe of dis discourse of India and Asia in general. That has to happen. And as that happens, a huge job, but as that happens, uh, this indigenous, truly indigenous form of Christianity without the Western trappings, will, will happen, will occur. And it, it will be dynamic and creative and fluid and open and assimilating these other values and insights, see, so that it will have something much richer to offer. So I, that is, that's, that's my hope and my expectation. Thank you, Wayne, for being with us. Oh.